candles. Good morning. Good morning. You know, as a as the instrument group was playing, I was thinking of a meme that I saw this morning or this week on Facebook, and I sent it to Sandy and Lois and, and Deb. And the meme was a big picture of an organist standing in front of the pipes of a big organ with a shotgun. <laughs> and the words below it said, if you guys don't be quiet during the prelude, you know what's going to happen. Knock, <laughs> knock. Who's there? Oh, come on, you can better than that. Knock, knock. Who's there? Tank. Hey. Hello. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh, 
those are so. I do. They're all okay. good. Wow. Okay, I got two short ones. I said, uh, what do you call a sleepwalking nun? A Roman Catholic. <laughs> How do you know Adams are Catholic? They have mass. <laughs> How do you know Atoms are Catholic if you didn't hear that? They have mass. Another joke. I have one. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> many, many years ago, I went to the doctor and he prescribed me with a diagnosis that is non addictive, mood altering, and it's called music. The common side effects include, but are not limited to, uncontrolled head bobbing, toe tapping, finger snapping, humming, selective hearing impairment, and persistent melody flashbacks. Ask your doctor if music is a correct diagnosis for you. <laughs>
was at Lawson and got the other one to get it to church at Sunday school. He's walking along, playing with his nickels and playing with his nickels, not watching where he's going, and he trips on the curb, and he catches one nickel, but the other one rolls down the curb, jumps down into the street, and goes into a rain gutter, and oh, he can't see it. And Johnny looks up at the sky with his one nickel and says, Oh, Lord, there goes your nickel. <laughs> and beyond our congregation. We thank the Stitching in Faith group for sharing these with us, and we offer a blessing for them. So let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the skills of those who have made these shawls. We ask you to bless them so that you know that our prayers go with them, that each of us blesses the person who receives them, Lord, we know that you carry our prayers and that you give our love. We ask you as we bless these that they may bring comfort and hope and peace to those who wear it. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Is somebody going to present one this morning? Darlene, I thought that was you. Thank you. 
day, and that is the day when Jesus rose from the dead. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had been were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus said that, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced as they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so now I send you. And he breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these were written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in the name of Christ.
I'll follow up on, on the Sunday school teacher. The little boy went home from Sunday school one day, and some of you may have heard this, but that's okay, it's good for a laugh. A little boy went home from Sunday school, and his mother said, what did you study in Sunday school today? He said, our teacher told us the story of Moses leading his people across the Red Sea into the Promised Land. Well, tell me the story, mother said. Well, the little boy said, Moses got all of his soldiers together, and the guerrilla forces woke up the people in the middle of the night and led them out to the Red Sea. But before they got to the Red Sea, Moses had radio with a head to his engineers and they built a bridge all the way across the Red Sea. And as soon as the people of Israel got across the Red Sea, Moses called the bombers and they came in. And just as the Pharaoh and his armies were getting on the bridge, the bombers bombed the bridge and destroyed them completely. And when they were on dry land, Moses radioed, Moses radioed ahead again to his engineers, and they built a paved highway all the way across the desert into the promised land. Now his mother thought for a minute, she said, I know Bible stories have changed. <laughs> I know translations of the Bible have changed, but that just seems so far-fetched. Did your teacher really tell you the story that way? The boy said, no, Mom, but you wouldn't believe what she told me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a man who flopped down next to a minister, next to a priest on a subway in, in New York. And the man smelled like a distillery. The man's tie was stained, his face was plastered with red lipstick, and a half empty bottle of gin was sticking in his torn coat pocket. He opened a newspaper and began to read. A few minutes later, he turned to the priest and said, Father, what causes arthritis? Well, the priest said, it's caused by loose living, being with cheap, wicked women, having too much alcohol, and a contempt for your fellow human beings. Wow, the drunk said, and he turned to his faith. The priest, thinking about what he said, maybe thought he'd gone too far, and he nudged the guy and said, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come on so strong. How long have you had arthritis? And the man replied, I don't have arthritis. I just read in the paper that the Pope does. <laughs> <laughs> we celebrate Holy Humor Sunday today because it's a party, a joke of the devil, Jesus rising from the dead. You know, the Bible has lots of things about laughter in it. My favorite is, out of Genesis, when Sarah says, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about what happens to me will laugh with me. And she named her son Isaac, who she gave birth to in her 91st year. And Isaac means laughter. God has given me laughter. You know, there's a famous saying, laughter is the best medicine, but in the Bible, in Proverbs, it says, Having a joyful and a cheerful heart is good medicine. Now we can find that throughout all of that. In Psalms 126, it says, When our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy, then they will say among all the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. You know, sometimes I think the image of church people is an image of sour, dour, <clears throat> serious people. I've even heard young people say, oh, we don't go to church because, oh my gosh, they're so serious. They're so quiet. And, and their prayers are so quiet. And their songs are so low and dreary. And if I do this again and knock anyone's fault, <laughs> He 
you will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. Now, I can't imagine when I'm at the sickest point of my life, when I'm at the most depressed point of my life, when I'm grieving the hardest of my life, that someone says to me, yes, God will fill your heart with laughter again. I might not respond very greatly, but it's a promise. It's a promise. And so today we read the scripture about Thomas, and honestly, I wish we could act that story out because that's a really funny story. You remember, if you were here last Sunday, when I said that you were to imagine that you went with Jesus to the upper room and had supper with him that night, and then you went back on Saturday night after Jesus died, and you locked the door, and you closed the windows, and you kept the lights off, and you talked really soft because you didn't want anyone to know you were hiding in there because they might come and get you. And then I said, imagine what it would be like on Sunday when the disciples gathered again and the doors were wide open. Jesus entered through that locked door and told his disciples that peace was to be with them. And they finally realized what he'd been trying to tell them all along. But Thomas, I don't know where Thomas was. Thomas, I think, was not only a doubting Thomas, I think he was a late Thomas. You know, there's some people that just don't show up until the party's over. And I think that was what Thomas was. He was up somewhere, probably hiding somewhere all by himself because he didn't want to associate with those other disciples. But a week later, he came. Now, during that week, he visited with the disciples, and the disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. He's alive. He's among us. We have seen the Lord. And Thomas said, ha! Ah, I think you guys are crazy. You're telling me one big joke. That can't be true. I don't believe the word of it. Unless I see it. <laughs> I think they're Before he reached Nineveh, they all said, hmm, 
That sounds like a fishy story. And what did Adam say? And I think I heard somebody already say this, but I'm going to say it again. What did Adam say when he was asked what his favorite holiday was? He said Christmas Eve. <laughs> and what kind of car would Jesus Christ drive? A Chrysler. <laughs> and how do we know what kind of vehicle the disciples drove? It says in the scripture that they were all in one accord. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Adam and Eve have to study math every day? Because God told them to be fruitful and multiple. <laughs> Does somebody else have another joke? I know somebody brought some. Nobody else. Come on, Dan, I see you there. I don't think I don't Oh, I thought that was your joke. <laughs> I was talking with the minister for the Lutheran Church last night. We were at a funeral for the Lutheran Church, and I said, well, you got your jokes all ready for tomorrow, and she said, I can't tell a joke. She said, I say the first line, and then I start giggling so hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So she I said, I grabbed Phil Lewis. He's a retired pastor there. He's going to tell all the jokes, because I can't do it. You know, our culture does not take laughter and joy as seriously as it should. In the Navajo culture, they have a ceremony called the first laugh. Their child is viewed as a gift, an ultimate gift that can never be abused or hurt. And the first laugh ceremony ensures that the child is constantly watched over. So from the time they're born, the child is never left alone, and there are usually two or three people watching that child as it's kept in a cradle ball until that child laughs for the first time. And this moment marks the birth of that child as a social and community being. And there is a celebration. And the person who birthed that child <coughs> first as a party for everybody else to try. Science is telling us in medicine that laughter is not just a frivolous thing. There are many studies that have conducted and laughter is good for our health. It relieves stress. It actually changes your organs when you laugh. I remember Norman Cousins, who had a massive heart attack early in his life. And he had read somebody that laughed somewhere that laughter was good medicine. So while he was in the hospital, and he had his friends bring him, if you guys can remember, uh, you know, uh, VHS tapes. And oh. he had his friends bringing VHS tapes and bringing a player, and he watched I Love Lucy and the Three Stooges, and every, every all day long, that's all he watched, and he laughed. Because he truly believed that laughter was healing. Laughter enhances your intake of oxygen-rich air. It stimulates your heart, your lungs, and your muscles. It increases the endorphins that are reduced, released in your brain. It activates your stress response, cools that response down. It can increase and then decrease your heart and blood pressure, which gives you a good, relaxing feeling. But laughter, laughter isn't just a quick pick-me-up. If you continue to make laughter an important part of your life, it improves your immune system, it relieves pain, it increases the personal satisfaction in your own life, and increases your mood. You know, some of us say, well, I don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> I don't like to laugh out loud because people will make fun of me. Well, then you need to practice that. Stand in front of a mirror, tell yourself a joke, and laugh as loud as you can. And then do that again every morning when you get up. Find a bunch of cartoons out of your newspaper or uh, memes off of it and print them out and paste them on your mirror or paste them by your computer or paste them on your doors so that you can see them and read them and laugh every time you see them. The funniest one I have hanging on my refrigerator is Marvin's favorite cartoon. And it has a sign on it that says, Grandpa's Computer Repair. And there's Grandpa with a hammer, beating the hammer <laughs> And that's been hanging on our refrigerator since we were married. <laughs> you see, 
see, if you learn to do special things to help you laugh, it increases your pain resistance and actually helps you develop better health. That's the natural, the natural wonder and gift of laughter. So, as the storm raged, the captain realized his ship was sinking fast, and he called <laughs> out. <laughs> Does anyone know how to pray? Pastor stepped forward and said, Captain, I am not praying. The guy just said, Good. You pray while the rest of us put on our life jackets. We're one short. <laughs> a pastor in the middle of the sermon, and this would never have been me, because if somebody falls asleep in the middle of my sermon, I figure that's what they need most is sleep. He noticed a man fell asleep with his head on his wife's shoulder, and he hollered at his wife, Break up your husband! She yelled back, You put him asleep, you wake him up! <laughs> when those guys were gathered in that upper room, John searched high and low for Peter. When he finally found him hanging out there in the upper room, he said, Peter, I got good news and bad news for you. What do you want first? Peter said, give me the good news. We got enough bad news lately. The good news, John said, is Jesus the Christ is risen. That's great, but what's the bad news? Well, I hate to tell you this, but he's really ticked off. <laughs> During her sermon on Jesus' teaching, we should love our enemies, the pastor asked the congregation to raise their hand if they had any enemies. Everybody in the congregation except Mrs. Watson in the front row did. And she had just turned 95. Mrs. Watson, the pastor asked, how can you live for 95 years if you don't have any enemies? And she said, they all died before me. <laughs> the Sunday school teacher asked the teacher, one last, one last. The Sunday school teacher asked the children to draw Christmas pictures. She goes over to one and she sees a student has drawn a picture of four people on an airplane. What is this, she said. Well, this is Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus on their flight into Egypt. Well, who's the fourth person? That's Pontius, the pilot. <laughs> and a true story, when we were reading the Easter story, as we did on Palm Sunday at one church, the youth were reading the things. And um, the youth sometimes, like all the rest of us, don't pronounce things right. And every time this one youth read scripture, she talked about Pontius the Pilates. Pontius the Pilates. And we all got the laugh. God has given us the gift of laughter. And God, through the scriptures, the life of Jesus, and the church has invited us not to waste that gift. To God be the glory in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us stand and sing together, He Lives. <laughs>
and our minds in prayer. Let us begin with silent prayer, offering up our prayers for others, for God's world, for creation, and for our own lives. Gracious God, if we were to list all the concerns we have, we would be here for the next week. If we were to list all the joys and gifts that you've blessed us with, we would be here for the next month. God, help us to always remember that the joys and the blessings outweigh the concerns. Even though our newspapers, our television, and even our hearts are filled with concerns. Your love and your joy tells us that nothing can separate us from that love and the gift of your power and healing. We pray for healing for all of those who are ill in body, body, mind, spirit, or soul. We pray for those who have been hospitalized. We pray for those who have died and for those who continue to grieve over the ones that they've lost. We pray for those who are in prison and who find themselves there because of their own acts or because of political reasons. We pray for those who have died in Ukraine and Gaza and Israel, but especially today for the aid workers who were murdered in Gaza. And we thank you, God, that your power extends to their families. We pray, God, that you will extend your power and influence upon those who make decisions in Israel, in Russia, in the Ukraine, and in the United States, even here in our area, where we're concerned about clean water and mining destroying the Black Hills. We pray, God, because we know that you hear all of our prayers. You know them before we pray but you know our need to remind ourselves of those things as we give them out of our own hands into you. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, thou wilt be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily prayer, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There was a little boy who grew up in a church that, in the Lord's Prayer, that instead of saying trespasses, they said debts. They went home to his mother and said, is God a banker? And his mother said, no, why do you ask? Well, every Sunday we pray for God to forgive us our debts and to help us forgive our debtors. And his mom said, that's not what she's talking about. God is talking about trespasses. And so he thought about it for a minute, and his mother prayed the Lord's Prayer with him. And she said, to trespasses and forgive those who trespass against us. And he said, well, why does God care about whether we walk on Mr. Jones's lawn or not? <laughs> and so the mother, rethinking it, taught her son to pray. Forgive us our sins and forgive those who have sinned against us. Will the ushers please come and help us? to give of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. <laughs>
God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you have given us this beautiful world with trees and mountains and rivers, with plains and grass, with, with all kinds of animals and all kinds of plants. We thank you, God, for the diversity that you have planned. We thank you for the diversity you have planned in creating the people on this planet. And we thank you for all of the universe, the stars, the heavens, the sun, and the moon. But most of all, we thank you for the stories that have been told to us about your presence in the scriptures that we share each day and each week. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was died, was buried, and was raised on the third day and who now is with you in heaven, guiding and gifting us. We remember that on the night before Jesus was betrayed and crucified, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, Eat from this, all of you. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal had ended, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to you, O God. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of you, O Lord, we come to receive these gifts you have given. We ask you to send the power of your Holy Spirit upon these gifts and bless them, that for us they may be the blood and body of Jesus, that we may take into ourselves and share as we share Christ with others. Bless each person here and let the power of your Holy Spirit fall upon them, that they too may go forth to tell the story in laughter, in love, and in tears with each person they meet. And in them might we each see the face of Jesus, who invites us to his table today. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is the table of Jesus Christ. It's not the table of the community church or of any denomination. It's not really even the table of Christianity, because Christianity didn't exist until over 100 to 150 years after Jesus died. It's the table of Jesus Christ. And it is Christ that invites you to this table. We will ask you to come forward, to receive the bread and to eat it, to receive the cup and to drink it, and then to go back to your seats. We ask you to come down the center aisle, go back around the side aisle if you can. So please, for those who are helping serve, come forward, and we will give our heart. We will share the communion with Christ our
And remember, you never go alone. God goes with you, before you, and in you. Smile at all you meet and laugh right out.